All right, Ryan, what's on your radar today? So it can often be hard to see some of the greatest threats to the public until it's too late and they're already upon us. Even if there were always a few people who had been shouting that we had better watch out. These past few weeks have given us loud warnings on a number of fronts, and I'm not talking about climate change, at least not today. I'm talking about the very real threats to the idea of government itself. One of the best ways to think of the definition of a government is that it is the entity that has a monopoly on the use of violence. To the extent that a government abuses that power, it becomes tyrannical. If it doesn't have a monopoly on violence, it becomes what we call a failed state, and competing gangs or warlords set up shop in various fiefdoms. In an age of cyber warfare, we have to think of the idea of what constitutes force more expansively. Hacking, I would argue, is a demonstration of force. These are powers that, in general, only a government should have, and those powers should be constrained by the populace, which ought to have democratic control over their government. That's the goal, anyway. Meanwhile, what we don't want to have happen is to have oligarchs or other unaccountable power centers start deploying violence or start engaging in cyber warfare. But that's exactly what we're starting to see. Earlier this month, a team of several dozen Colombian and American mercenaries assassinated the Haitian president, throwing the country's politics into even greater turmoil. It's not yet clear who was responsible. Some have tried to pin the blame on a pastor from South, Far South Florida, but that looks implausible. Instead, as journalist Kim Ives noted here recently, it appears to be the work of rival elements of the Haitian elite. The fact that a faction of elites would turn to mercenaries to assassinate their president should be a wake-up call. In a world with runaway inequality, there are now thousands of people globally who can afford to deploy that type of mercenary unit. All it takes to set off a civil war and who knows what else is for one billionaire or multi-millionaire idiot to have a bad idea and act on it. The blossoming of the mercenary industry is the responsibility of the U.S., which has sowed nonstop violence in Central and South America for the past half century, the perfect training ground for mercenaries. We helped fuel a 50-year civil war in Colombia. And while that war might now be over, the fighters are still around, they're still trained, and they're still looking for work, making Colombia a leading exporter of hired guns. Billionaires aren't the only threat. In October, as I reported at The Intercept, Bolivia's defense minister tried to bring American mercenaries into the country to stop a socialist party from taking power after it had won a, a legitimate election. The defense minister's party had come to power through a coup, and they intended to stay in power however they could. Fortunately, that plan didn't come together, but the next plan might. So yesterday, the Washington Post, collaborating with media outlets around the world, published a bombshell story showing that software made by the NSO Group, an Israeli cyber firm, was being used to hack and surveil journalists, activists, and politicians all around the world. They're not the only ones with those capabilities, and Israel has made exporting such technology a significant industry. Combine these three developments, massive wealth inequality, the proliferation and availability of soldiers of fortune, and the proliferation of, of offensive cyber capacity, and wealthy private individuals now have many of the powers that were once reserved to governments at their fingertips just a few clicks away. An NSO group is just one firm. U.S. billionaires who control vast amounts of pension fund money and other assets have been investing heavily in the industry. So while these mercenaries have been treating the world like a shooting range, Congress has been busy writing legislation to create even more of them. The Senate bill called the Endless Frontiers Act includes more money for foreign military training with no serious safeguards. And safeguards aren't even the point. You could put whatever strings you want on the funding and the training, but once you've trained somebody to kill, they don't forget, even if the program ends. Luckily, the House hasn't passed its version of the bill. That one is called the Eagle Act, and it hasn't gone through the chamber yet. This is where progressives have leverage. They can demand that the U.S. stop training new foreign fighters. The next step is to make companies feel pain for behaving like governments. Under today's regime, most of these cyber and mercenary firms are basically doing the bidding of the U.S., even if they're not being directly instructed. That's their value. 
But as a new populist foreign policy rises, the left and right need to come together and crack down on these private militias for hire. If you own a security company that rents out soldiers or hackers, and your company is tied to human rights abuses or to the overthrow of a government, you should be held liable, prosecuted, and barred from doing business. There can only be one sheriff in this town. And so, Emily, some of this is going to be uh, uncomfortable, I think, for progressives because they don't like to think about the idea of government having these, these, these dangerous powers, a monopoly on violence. But if we don't, like it's a, you have a failed state. You have Somalia in the 1990s where you just have uh, warlords competing with each other. So governments need to assert their authority. They, ne they, need, they need to govern with the consent of the governed. If you have these other private actors starting to behave this way, it's just throwing, you know, throwing out governments, assassinating presidents, hacking whoever they want to hack, doesn't that become kind of a fundamental threat to the very idea of a democratic government? Well, absolutely. And we talked about this yesterday. The concept of hacking is something that our laws and even our just general consensus on what constitutes force, it has not caught up with that yet. And we know that it's how governments see the use <laughs> of force. We know that internally they see, you can talk about our negotiations with China. You can talk about Russia. We know that this is essentially, I mean, people have said this is waging basically war. It's, it's yeah. cyber war. It is a use of force. And to reconceive of these notions of what in 2021 constitutes military force is essential. And secondly, you said something really interesting, which is that these mercenaries were hired by the Haitian elites. Mm -hmm. And as in this country, we continue to splinter. And as we have oligarchs with concentrations of power, it becomes essential. It becomes essential right. that we figure out what's happening in this industry, because it's an industry, right. as you point out. It's been an industry for a long time, right. but when you combine it with the sort of socioeconomic factors, that's scary. Right, and so, and so Elon Musk, after the 2019 Bolivia coup, uh, I'm sure he would say he was sort of joking, but he was going back and forth with somebody on Twitter who was condemning uh, the coup in, in Bolivia. There's a lot of uh, lithium and other minerals that are important to kind of battery-powered technologies that, that, uh, that Tesla relies on. And Elon Musk replied to somebody and said, uh, you know, we will coup whoever we want. Yeah. And, okay, maybe he's joking, maybe, maybe he's trying to be funny, whatever. There's some seriousness to it when, yeah. I, when, a, when one of the richest people and at times the richest person in the world says something like that. But what's dangerous to think about is that Elon Musk, if he wants to, can, can now you know, fund NGOs in Bolivia if he wants to. Yeah. <clears throat> he can hire mercenaries. Uh, he can hire cyber warfare mm -hmm. uh, companies. So if he wants to engage in some type of, and I'm just using him as an example, if he wants to engage in some kind of foreign policy in a country that has a raw material that he wants, he has the capacity to do that. Extra, uh, outside of the out, United States military. Outside of the United States. Uh, and so he then ends up setting foreign policy rather yep. than voters setting, yep. setting foreign policy unless, unless voters and politicians here in the U.S. start to take it serious and say, you know what, actually, we don't just want a monopoly on like the idea of violence that that's what a state is. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to do our foreign policy, not you. Well, and let's just stick with that hypothetical for a moment and talk about if he wanted to wage cyber warfare in one of those countries. Right now, that flies completely under the radar. And mm -hmm. again, like our military knows that it constitutes force, but our sort of our public consen consensus on what is force, our media consensus on what is force, he can do whatever he wants mm -hmm. because people aren't paying attention. He can do it really cleverly. Um, he can, you know, use NSO in a way that it's going to take the Washington Post maybe a year to catch up to. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the Post, the Post, that is a really important piece of reporting, I think. And I think it is bringing this onto people's radar. The legislation you talk about should bring it onto people's mm -hmm. radar. But the cyber, the hypothetical of the cyber point is such an important one because we just haven't caught up with the technology on this. Right. And, and right now, Elon Musk and all these other people who are, who are engaging mercenaries, et cetera, they're kind of in line with what the U.S. wants them to do anyway. But we have to think about a future world where a populists are actually in, in control and want a different foreign policy. And in that case, you can't have cowboys just go running around the world doing whatever they want. But I'm very much looking forward to seeing what is on your radar next.